Okay, welcome to week whatever we have five, four, whatever it is, um, our second week of the personal identity um, unit. So last week we talked about uh, Locke's conception of um, personal identity as the psychological continuity criterion. Um, does anybody want to like tell us what that means for Locke to be a person? No. But online, does anybody remember what Locke says about psychological continuity? It has been seven days. It's a long time. Well, Locke says that memory is what makes the self the self. Okay, so um, in order to persist, you have to remember that uh, that past experience of yours was yours and it's your memory that sustains your identity. Now there's all sorts of weird issues to do with uh, memory loss and being asleep, uh, blacking out drunk, et cetera. Um, interesting counterexamples and objections. Um, and we also talked a little bit about the role of the body in personal identity, right? Like I, I think I gave you guys the thought experiment where you have the body swap, the evil scientist, dude, this is why you don't give philosophers NIH grants, by the way, is because they'll pull brains out of bodies and put them in other bodies and like clone a million Hitlers to see if they all want to, you know, start World War III um, or if like a few of them don't, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so don't give philosophers science money because we'll be evil scientists. Uh, but the, the evil scientist in this thought experiment switches the brains and then says, hey, if you pay me a hundred bucks, I won't torture your body. Um, and so we feel like that attachment to body, it pumps our intuition, makes us think, well, hey, maybe the body is kind of important for um, my conception of self. So that was last week. We got some ideas of what identity might consist in, what it is, what this I that I refer to is uh, when uh, I speak in the first person, as in that sentence. Um, this week, we're going to do something different. We're going to run through a bunch of uh, thought experiments that will challenge hopefully all of our ideas of identity and um, make you very confused about what you are. And if you are very confused at the end, then um, I will be a happy teacher. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna play a game. I'm gonna run through a bunch of cases that are really quite strange. Um, and I wanna hear what you guys think about this, what the I is, okay? Um, so we're gonna be asking ourselves in all these cases, who or what is that I? that uh, is on the other end of the thought experiment. So we're gonna start in like position one with a pretty clear sense of at least intuitively what we think the self is and then we'll end up on the uh, other end of the thought experiment in um, confusion and challenge. And there's no win conditions except when um, you find out what your intuitions are about identity. But before we start, we've had a week now to think about what identity is. And we've been, you know, challenged a little bit to, to consider. So I'm wondering if any of you guys in person or online have had any thoughts since last week, since our Locke lecture on what you think the self is. Anybody want to share? Who are you? Yeah. Just like a bag of meat, really. You're a bag of meat, really. <laughs> Well, if you think about it, we have like the skin around yeah. us, and then we're just like filled with meat. Yeah, sure. And then we have like some sort of conscience in our mind. Uh -huh. But theoretically, well, figuratively, no, not fig literally, we're just meat with bones just held together. And some electricity going on. Yep, some neuron firing. Yeah, so um, here, what, what if I do this? I put my foot up and I say, is that me? That, that's a part of my like your bo meat body meat or body. whatever. It's yeah. kind of gross to say it that way. Um, but you know, we'll stick with it for continuity. Um, is, is that me? Yes. Is that me? Yes. Are these the same? They're not the same. Okay, what makes the difference? What's, what's connecting the me in your intuition here? Different functionalities. Different functionalities. Okay, interesting. So this is this is a cool set of definitions. There's a lot going on in, in your comment here. Um, we are uh, a vessel of flesh. I like that. Um, better. That's better than bag of meat. Yeah, vessel, uh, vessel of flesh. 
Uh, so you might think that the body is the self here. Uh, but then you also said that there's a conscience that's housed in that body, right? Uh, and then I, I imposed on you the electricity thing, right? Which yes. uh, I did deliberately to get a sense of the brain, right? Because the brain is, is a part of the flesh thing that we mm -hmm. are. Um, but that's what produces the conscience uh, element. You don't have the, the conscious, thoughtful quality of perception and representation without a brain. Mm -hmm. um, so you have sort of just like ran the gamut of the, the ideas that, that are common at least uh, for identity, body, mind, brain. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, anybody else besides body, mind, and brain have any other alternative intuitions about what you are? Who are you? Yeah. Um, I guess I think I'm kind of my consciousness so that it, it, that experiential knowledge, that phenomenological knowledge that's carried with this juxtaposition of my brain, my mind, my body, coming in this temporal moment. Um, I don't know how that like persists through time necessarily, but like, I guess I would consider myself the culmination of these experiences, mental processes, bodily processes that I've had yeah. up until now and going into the future and the past, which we just see linearly sure. um, as then forming what it's like to be me. Good, okay, so now, rather than picking any particular feature, say like uh, body, mind, brain, um, we are a uh, unity realized phenomenologically, meaning like phenomenology is like the experience of what it's like. So um, the phenomenology of me looking at this television remote is as of blackness and kind of rectangularness, it has a shape, it's a certain weight, right? It's the, there's a qualitative experience, right? And, and that would, be my phenomenology. Now, the phenomenological sort of unity of body and mind and presence uh, is something that we'll talk about at the very end of the semester. Um, and, and I have some fun stuff planned and we'll all talk about it during the break because um, I kind of want to get Neil's input. I've been working behind the scenes to do some creative stuff with our class time for the end of the semester. Um, it's uh, a quality of, I don't know if it's like necessarily identity, but um, selfness, you might say, uh, that's talked a lot about in the continental philosophy tradition. So like philosophers from uh, Europe, not in the uh, American and UK, more scientific empirical traditions. Um, so people like Heidegger, for instance, talks about Dasein, right? The, the um, being uh, in itself, quality of what it's like to be. Um, which I know is just a mouthful of words that sound like they make no sense, but it's because they, they make no sense because it's, it's not a quality of being that you can conceive of that can separate itself out in concept and thought, but is only experienced, right? That there's an absorbed state a way that we operate in the world and it just kind of works. Like when I pick up the remote, I, I don't have to think about the fact that it's not glued to the table, right? I just like pick it up and, and I know without needing to think about it that it does, right? And there's a certain kind of relationship that I have um, with the world. And when we're speaking about self or identity, the, the identity is not the, the thing here or the world out there, but the relation, the interaction between the two realized through a, a sort of phenomenology of absorption, um, the, the interaction with technology as Heidegger might call it. Um, it, it's an interesting alternative way of thinking about that. So good. Um, any other ones? Anybody online want to share who you think you are? Who are you? You don't know. It's okay. I don't know either. Um, okay, but maybe we'll find out and probably not as we go forward. Okay, so body swaps. Um, Locke gives this example. I think this was in your reading um, from last week where Locke talks about uh, like a prince or a king or somebody, some stately court aristocrat person um, having a, uh, like their friend um, talk to them, but their friend is in the body of the parrot and the parrot communicates all sorts of incredibly articulate 
you wouldn't expect a parrot to be able to say, um, to hold completely cogent, intelligent thoughts. Um, and he says, look, uh, we would call the parrot a person, right? We, in fact, I would call that parrot my friend. Um, so here we have our, um, what would you call this person? Uh, neoliberal 50s boomer man okay. <laughs> selling, uh, I don't know, life insurance. Ah, insurance. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the time period. Bro. And and he's, you know, on the phone talking about Reagan and trickle down economics, <laughs> and, and he's all very excited. And then, and then, oh, we moved the brain into the parrot, and now the parrot is talking about Reaganomics and trickle down. Uh, how it totally works it, how it totally works <laughs> and we'll leave it at that um and the man on the phone uh begins calling like a macaw um so in this case do we think that the macaw the parrot here is neoliberal boomer man Oh, I don't know. Tough. Good. It's an okay answer. So it's just the brain that's been swapped. Yeah, and you might even say like they have the same brains, but you know, like some by some dark magic, like, and then the well, the conscience swapped. Yeah, like the the you, like if the mind isn't attached to the brain, and and we can do it either way, just like whatever we want for the fun of the thought experiment. If the mind isn't attached to the brain, you could just take like the floaty ethereal mental stuff and then put it into the parrot so now it's talking like you know Iago from Aladdin is, is that neo liberal boomer man no why not shaking your head I, I guess because it's a different body there's a different set at least for me of phenomenological experiences like now he can like fly while he talks about Reaganomics <laughs> good so <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what, what is it Wittgenstein says? If a lion could speak, we would not understand what he says. Because so like a lion could like walk up to you and start telling you about Narnia in the closet. Um, and because it's a lion, so argues Wittgenstein, uh, even if it makes sense to us, we have no um, actual connection to the language game or whatever that the lion is playing. And so it might sound like the right sort of phonemes and like verbal construction that would make sense to us, but the line really means something totally different. Um, so th this is a, a good objection that the, the quality of what it's like to um, experience and think is essentially related to um, the mind's connection to a body. And even if the parrot is very excited by um, the lowering of taxes on the wealthiest bracket of Americans, um, that the form through which this idea is experienced is different, um, it, just in quality. And that's enough to say that, no, it's not neoclass neoliberal boomer man anymore. Now that he's a parrot. Them. Now that he's a parrot, you go around the world and teach everyone about Reaganomics oh, and, God. Uh, <laughs> and spread the idea. Philosophy <laughs> class is becoming a nightmare class now. <laughs> okay, um, good. Does anybody think that the parrot is neoliberal boomer man? No. I mean... Just as much as he isn't, he also is. Just as much as he isn't, he also is. Well, yes, but also no. Yes. <laughs> Okay, um, so so this is maybe a good point. Um, when we're uh, when I'm asking like who is who, um, we don't need to stay to the strict definition of like numeric identity that we were looking for last week or that Locke was looking for. Right? Um, we can you know use our intuitions and we can you know like say what we think about cases and. Um, there will be no right or wrong answer, but every answer will be challenged in one way or another. So the, well, yes, but also no answer is, is a good one because it um, says, well, yeah, I mean, like for all intents and purposes, if the parent, so say like my uh, father um, flew up to me in the body of a macaw and started 
talking to me about things that only my dad would know, like through our relationship. Um, I would be surprised to say the least, um, but I would still think that that was him. Um, but it's not the same way that I've related to him in the past because he's flown up to my window, you know, having not even knocked. Um, so, so these are strange cases, right? Where we get rid of the body and we think about the mind going into some other form. So like you, you teleport the mind into say like a computer, right? What if you could download the, the mind into a silicon chip that processed thought just the same way, but instead of flesh vessel, it's now silicon vessel. Um, does this change our intuitions about the, the brain swap case? Do we think that the computer is the, the, the downloaded computer brain is the, the same person? Can the downloaded computer brain create more memories or is it only, uh, does it only stop at the moment in time when it was taken out? Good, so let's, let's do both. Um, because it's stopping at the moment in time that it's, it's transferred. It is not anymore. It's not the same person. No. But if it creates new memories? It would be the same person because it would act the same way and being able to persist through time, understanding new events. That's kind of an interesting intuition. That, that's sort of the opposite of what I would have guessed. I would have said at, this, at the exact moment of its transfer, it's the same person because nothing has shifted. But then any moment past, uh, it's gaining new experiences as it would have, but through like the computer body, like it's like Googling, but just like blink and I Google something. You know? um, but yeah, I, li I like this idea too, that um, it's acquisition of new experiences, uh, that, that the, the form of, of physical containment that the mind is housed in um, is less essential to identity than the uh, like form through which the mind will like reason and decide how to experience new things. Um, so certainly the computer will experience the world differently than the, the human body, but the mind has a certain like heuristic or set of rules for what it's like to experience, how to like ask questions, what are interesting questions ask, this sort of thing. Um, and those rules and heuristics, the mental ones are um, more central sounds like in, in your, your thought here. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. Um, so, so kind of interesting contrasting intuition. So a little bit uh, weightier on mind, a little weightier on body, or you know some sort of phenomenology. Cool. Um, so body swaps are pretty common in you know popular culture. Happen all over the place. Freaky Friday. Yeah. Right. Um, Jamie Lee Curtis and Lindsay Lohan. Um, does one become the other? Who's who? Um, fun philosophical problem. So I promised a thought experiment last week and we didn't exactly do it uh, because I thought this was in my slides last week. Turns out it was in this week's slides. Um, so this is called the duplication case or fission case. Um, and although we aren't talking about it in this class, if you took a personal identity class, um, or sometimes like mind language and reality, you can talk about these as well. Um, you we'll talk about patients who have had their corpus callosum snipped, right? So the corpus callosum is the muscle that connects the right and left hemispheres of the brain. Uh, and it used to be, I don't think they do it anymore, but uh, like the early aughts, they would snip it in half and it would like stop people from having terrible seizures. Uh, and for all intents and purposes in everyday regular life, uh, you would be a normal person, right? There would be no like freaky weirdness, except you would just not have your terrible seizures anymore. However, in experimental conditions, you can do really strange things to these people. So for instance, if you cut off their vision uh, right down the middle, and so they're like seeing different things on the right and left side. Um, and just by the way, the, the right eye is processed in the left hemisphere in this other way. So like your brain works like an X with uh, left eye over here being processed in the right side of the brain and then right eye processed in the left. Um, you can do strange things like uh, flash an image on the right or on the left side of the on the, the left side of the, the participant so that it's processed on the right side of the brain where there's not like the language center. Um, you ask them, what did you just see? And they'll say, I have no idea what I just saw. Even though you, just, you flashed the image, 
Um, and then you have their hand and they can't see, like they're reaching in a box, you know, like in Halloween is like, what is the thing you're touching? It's not eyeballs, it's peeled grapes or whatever. Same idea. Um, they reach in and they grab the object. So they'll verbally say, I have no idea. I didn't see anything, but then their hand will grab the object that was flashed in front of them. Weird stuff. Um, you also, in real life, you'll have reports of these people, like their left hand will reach for the green jacket in their, um, in their closet and the right hand will slap it away. Like, no, that clashes with your pants that you've chosen to, that sort of thing. Um, so you get strange cases like this. And Wiggins is um, a foster cognitive scientist, uh, super famous who was interested in these kinds of cases. Um, and the duplication case is a thought experiment about personal identity that challenges the idea that identity might be housed in the brain, that whatever it is that uh, we are, when I talk about the self or, or myself, when I speak in the first person, what I'm referring to is not necessarily my physical body because I could chop off an arm and still be me. Um, it's not really my memories because sometimes I fall asleep. Really, it's whatever is housed in the brain. Okay, um, so here we have a, we can call him Alfred at time one, uh, and Alfred has a brain for now, um, but we take out that brain and we slice it in half so that they are two perfectly identical halves of the brain, okay? And then we have two other bodies, they're named B and C, and we put the perfectly sliced in half brains of Alfred into B and C at time two, okay? Again, don't give philosophers money to do science because um, we will take advantage of it. Okay, so what's going on? What should we say about this case? Who's who? Is Alfred in, is, is, is B now Alfred? Are they even alive at this point? Yeah, they're alive. Yeah, they they're can alive. like function? Thought experiment. <laughs> oh, thought, okay. Yeah, this is not real science. Um, but imagine that uh, the half of the brain um, is, you know, has like the entire mind of Alfred, okay? So um, whatever Alfred was at time one with two halves of the brain, um, both B and C are perfectly operative in the same exact ways. So you might think of them as like clones, but instead of like cloning the whole body, you've just taken the brain, split it in half and put it in two bodies, okay? So is B, Alfred? B and C are Alfred. Both are Alfred. Yeah. I mean, they're basically two different people at that point. They're two different people at this point. Good. Another good answer. Oh, yeah. Anybody else? Okay, so here's the breakdown. Um, Alfred is neither B nor C, right? It's just possibility. So like what I'm gonna do is like map out the possibility space. It could be that Alfred is neither B nor C. It could be that Alfred is A or B, but not C, like one, but not the other, or the other, but not the one, right? Or it could be that Alfred is both B and C. And this is our possibility space, right? This is like, if you're gonna answer the question, it, should probably be one of these. You could probably get creative, but um, straightforwardly, these are your possible answers. Okay. So um, nobody said Alfred is neither. Well, wait, sorry, James, you said Alfred is neither B nor C, right? They're B and C are different people than A. Yeah, they're basically just different people at that point because if they aren't together, then they're just one half of one person. Yeah, which good. It becomes its own person at that point. But the experiment was a success, right? That we got perfect like uh, replicas of Alfred mentally in B and C. So it's at least a little strange. Um, I think this is maybe this is a good direction to go if you want to write an argument or whatever. But it is a little strange to say that a double success we get Alfred twice turns out to be a failure, right? Um, it, it's uh, it, it would be a strange paper to write regardless. But if this is your Results section would be a little extra strange. And our second option, 2.1 and 2, this is a little arbitrary. Right? Like if they're exactly identical, B and C, then why should we favor the one over the other except arbitrarily? Um, so this does not seem to get us any further. But if we say A is both B and C, one thing can't be identical to two things. One is not equal to one and one. It's only equal to itself, right? X is equal to X, right? We talked about that last week. Um, if identity is a one-to-one -one relation um, and we've split that relation in two, garden of forking paths has now sort of broken our, our um, 
satisfaction with this kind of answer. So if identity is housed in the brain and <clears throat> we can edit and move around the brain into different bodies, this uh, duplication or fission case um, seems to challenge that intuition. Um, so we could uh, get creative with our answers and say, well, uh, Alfred was one person, but Alfred always had a divided mind, you know, like the corpus callosum split, the, the right half of the brain really likes that green coat and the left half, half of the brain doesn't. So it's like two people inside of you, you know, inside of everyone, there's two wolves, right? And one of those wolves is B and the other is C. Uh, but, you know, th they were always two people is kind of a strange thing to say, right? That you live now, or Alfred lived then pre T1, a unified experience uh, as if, as of a single person. Alfred didn't think of uh, themselves as multiples, but as I, right, a single entity, an individual. Um, but now imagining that these two halves are suddenly like revealed, it just, there was no evidence phenomenologically or empirically of that before the fission. So these options seem implausible. Um, and forced by our commitment to identity, right? That we want there to be a single person in all of us that explains who we are and what we are. But in order to explain this kind of case, if we want identity to be housed in the brain, then the division of mind or the coincidence of two people or multiple people, if we split the brain in four, you can split it as many times as you like um, and make you know multiples ABC all the way to Z of Alfred, um, this, these are all going to be strange answers um, because we're committed to an idea of like what identity should be, right? Should be just a brain or just a singular sense of self, right? Um, so did we watch the part of the video for this week to, on YouTube? Anybody? No? It's like, it's like six minutes from a documentary. Uh, part is an awesome English philosopher, was. Uh, wrote this book, Reasons and Persons, where half the book is about how to decide what to do, and the other half is about like who we are, what, what we are. Um, and so Parfit will like sort of preview his answer here and then talk about it at the very end of the lecture. Um, he just says, look, it isn't clear what we should think about these cases if we think we must answer the question of identity to say something important. And what this means is if this sense of like unified self is meant to do important either empirical or normative work, meaning like, you know, like scientific explains the world descriptively, like what the world is and how it fits together, you know, like the building blocks of nature, um, the, the empirical part or the normative part, normative means like uh, normative and prescriptive, I mean like moral, so like uh, how we feel about the world, what makes it good or bad. Um, if this sense of a unified self and identity, that sort of identity that we wanna be committed to or that we are committed to intuitively through just like living at all um, is to do important work. This case makes it unclear that um, uh, the answer to who Alfred is can be answered by our commitment to identity that's supposed to be doing important work. Hint, we should throw out this sense of identity. That'll be Parfit at the end. Um, so Parfit concludes that there are just some questions about identity for which there are no answers. Um, and let's look at some more of these cases. The next case we're gonna look at is the teleportation case, okay? Um, this is kind of a fun one. So just in case you have strange ideas about the shape of the earth, this is meant to be amenable to everyone. Um, you know, just be inclusive in philosophy class. Uh, and here's an alien on Mars. Looks like they're like either dancing or helping the like shuttle land, you know, land here. Um, okay, so imagine we're in some strange sci-fi future um, and you see an advertisement. We have a great new technology to send you to Mars instantly for $29.99, the low, low price. You can hop in our antimatter quantum recombobulator and begin the space adventure of your dreams. Quite the advertisement, only $30. And you get to dance with naked alien man. Um, so Peggy here uh, says, great, sign, sign me up. I'm ready to go. So Peggy rules 
she's in a wheelchair. It looks like rolls in her wheelchair into this teleport. Actually, I have no idea what this photo is. Is this like some sort of like bank tube for, for people? <laughs> Weirdly, it looks like a <clears throat> like a security checkpoint where they like body scan you, but it's big enough to where you could have a wheelchair in it. Yeah. Too? Some nice art next to your <laughs> body scanning device. Yeah. yeah I'm going more with like a, like a bank shoot. <laughs> yeah, to send you to different hospital rooms. Um, and uh, Peggy <clears throat> wants to be teleported uh, to Mars. So at time two, she'll be at Mars. But how does this teleporter work? Well, the teleporter works uh, with antimatter quantum recombobulation, which is a fancy made up way of saying it deletes Peggy in the first place and then recreates her in the second place. Okay, so let's get the case straight. What's happening? Peggy rolls into the uh, teleporter. The teleporter scans her body, right? Um, and wheelchair, I suppose, too. Um, it takes an exact, like down to the, the like electron position in every atom of her body, like an exact scan, copies it, sends those blueprints over to Mars and then recombobulates atoms in exactly that form. So every single physical feature of Peggy is realized in the copy on Mars, and then the teleporter zaps her and deletes her atoms on Earth, okay? So is Peggy the same person after this zap recreate um, at T2 as she was in T1? Is the Peggy on Mars the same Peggy as she was on Earth? Well, yeah, if it's like to exact dimensions. Yeah. And if it, I mean, do we know that it's deleting part of her memory? No, everything is exactly, is exactly well, then, the same. Yeah, everything is preserved. Yeah, then Peggy's Peggy. Peggy's Peggy. Still in yeah. a wheelchair though. Still, yeah, still in a wheelchair. Seems like if you could recreate every atom, you could probably you know, like fix the spine or whatever. Yeah. How about online? What do you guys think? Is is Peggy on Mars the same as Peggy was on Earth? Yeah, I would say so. I would say yes, as soon as she gets to Mars, she's the same person. Oh, good. Um, as Why soon do you as say she, that? Because, because if she is an exact copy of what she was on Earth, if all of her memories and her conscience, if it's all the exact same, she experiences the same emotions. But as soon as she starts experiencing anything with any of one of her five senses on Mars, then she's a little bit of a different person. She's- She keeps growing. Yeah. She's not the exact same. She has, a, she has new information that she didn't have on Earth. Good, good, okay. Um, so it seems like we're all in agreement then, Peggy, has been vaporized, but she's recombobulated different atoms, whatever, they're in the same position, it's the same Peggy, right? Identity is in our atoms. We shed our body and recreate it all the time, right? In fact, that's how we die. Yeah. And our bodies get worse at doing that over time. Um, so let's challenge this intuition. Um, by the way, are, are you not a little disturbed that like they just delete Peggy on Earth? I mean, it, def it defies literally the fundamental laws of physics of matter cannot be uh destroyed nor like created you well, know like I mean, no, maybe she's ashes or something i don't know well i mean if we're vaporizing yeah. you know there has to be some sort mm -hmm. of combustion so <laughs> if we're talking about yeah. like we're actually like deleting peggy and there's like ash on the ground peggy is not peggy anymore Oh, okay. So you think if there's ash on the ground. So wait, wait, wait. If Peggy's old self, Peggy one, P at time one, if she, if we actually go by the laws of physics, matter cannot be destroyed nor created. Extra matter was what I'm talking about. And she actually like gets deleted, but in the computer they go, okay, this is exactly what it is for Peggy. If she gets deleted. She's going to lose her mind. She's going to lose every conscience that she, every event she's ever been to be recreated by the computer, put all of those events that was just, you know, zapped by whatever supercomputer went in her mind and took all that. She's going to be a new Peggy because if we're going by the laws of physics, that's new creation. 
Yeah, sure. But it's the same. She has the same personality, right? But so, I'm but saying it's different that, matter. Yeah. So, but it's, so just taking atoms from like space and recombobulating them into like Peggy form from on Mars. Yes. And le- okay. So let's change the case a little bit. How about this? Um, you guys seen Futurama? Yes. Yeah. I like one of the first show. episodes is like the suicide booth. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and this is how I think Bender and Fry meet yeah. right, in the suicide booth. Um, and you know, he like Bender like puts in the quarter and pulls it out on the string in the suicide booth. Um, <laughs> So let's imagine instead of like, like just deleting Peggy from existence, the machine uh, takes the scan, and in the same moment that it like reorganizes atoms on Mars to be Peggy, uh, a gun like shoots her in the head, and she dies. Right. So she's she's on Mars and she's like you know wailing around having a great time like that was, that was the best thirty bucks I ever spent, but her you know bleeding corpse is now sitting in this teleportation machine waiting for the poor graduate student to clean it up. <laughs> um, it is, is Peggy on Mars? Is, this, is that Peggy? She is Peggy, but she wouldn't be the original Peggy. Ah, okay. Um, but isn't identity supposed to be a one-to-one relation where like X equals X is persistence through time? Oh, yeah. But... If you were to think of it that way, it would just be a clone at that point. But if you just were just a clone, if you were to think of it in the way that the matter turns into energy and then the energy gets reformed in the matter somehow, then it would be the original Peggy at that point. All right. Um, so now we think of a clone as something different from the original. Okay, good. Let's yes. let's keep these let's keep these thoughts. This is, this is with that one. Good. Okay, so same case, <clears throat> except the machine fails. It does not delete Peggy. Uh, and now, so you notice that uh, above T1 became T3, right? Okay. Oh. So now T1, Peggy gets scanned and zapped over to Mars, and then the machine fails to delete her or, you know, like summarily shoot her in the head. Um, and uh, now she exists on both Mars and Earth. And they both, well, one of them thinks that was a waste of $30 and the other thinks, great, now I get to dance with this alien buddy of mine. Which one's Peggy? The, the original. The original. The second would be a copy, a clone. Good. Okay. Chime in. Sorry if I'm just trying to take in all, all of these. I'm just so confused. And it's good. Oh, it hurts. <clears throat> so Peggy rolls out of the machine after. So like, let, let's do like the gun thing. You know, she sees the gun pop out and it misfires. And so she rolls the heck out of there. It's like, oh, please don't do that to me. I don't want to die today. Um, so she rolls out. Don't vaporize me. I'm the real Peggy. I don't want to die. Who is the real Peggy? It's the one that rolled out. Mm-hmm. Even though there's a atom for atom replica with all the same thoughts, emotions, she cares for the same people. She has the same history, the same story, same wheelchair, just you know, different atoms, different place, same time. That's not Peggy? I mean, after time has passed, neither of them are Peggy as compared to the original one. The Peggy from time one. Yeah. Good, okay. So there's only identity in the instant. Okay. Um, Have you ever watched uh, CGP Grey? No. Uh, he does a very good video on it. On, on these teleportation cases? Yeah. On the All teleportation right, so, so what, case. If, what if we asked Peggy on Mars, who are you? What's she going to say? That she's Peggy. And are you gonna her. are you gonna tell her no? I'd tell her she's a clone of Peggy One. Like there's there's an original body because the experiment failed. And how do you think she'd respond to that? She's pretty confused. Yeah. And Until the confusion would come it. from this like like sense of commitment to like her being who she is, right? Mm-hmm. And you're telling her something different. Yeah. Good. So we're starting to see like some of the weird challenges that we get yeah. mind and body come apart okay so let's do a third teleportation case okay so it's the same case but the machine fails again and this time it really screws up okay um so peggy has been scanned and it does not delete peggy it does not summarily shoot her in the head 
um, nor does she appear on Mars. Okay, so Peggy, oh no, she does get vaporized oh. in this case. <laughs> Sorry, this, this will come later. Peggy's gone. I, I'm out of order. Uh, so in this in teleportation case three, Peggy is in fact zapped um, and she doesn't show up on the other end. Her husband calls her on Mars and says, hey, how's the weather? And the phone rings into voicemail and that's the end for Peggy's husband. What a guy. Um, oh, but wait, until 40 years later, she appears. There she is. It's 40 years later. But in those 40 years, her husband's died. Her children are now the age that she was when she rolled into the teleporter in the first place. Technology has exploded. They no longer use these out-of-date teleporters anymore. It's amazing that this one is still around on Mars. Everything is unrecognizable. Um, and now there she is, the exact replica of Adam's the exact state of mind that she was in 40 years ago, now on Mars, but everything around her has changed. Is she Peggy? No, she's still a clone. She's still a clone. He's original. It, it goes back to being omitted from the planet, just like, boom, Good. matter's gone. So now we're thinking that identity is in the body, right? Really strongly. And identity is not to do with anything in the mind. Um, good. Yeah. Oh, but it's also like, it's also the mind too. Yeah, we can download the mind into a computer, right? Yeah, good. So th these these questions that what, like what we're thinking, this is hard. And this case should confuse your idea of the phenomenology, right? Because she's the same person, existentially speaking, mentally, she has the same body. She's the same like, technological relation to her wheelchair and, and the way that she works in the world, but everything in that world has changed. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know what the strange devices around her are or do. She's confused and overwhelmed by the blooming, buzzing confusion of her new 40 year in the future world. Strange, right? She doesn't have the same relationship to the world, though she has the same mind and body. How did the 40 years pass for her? Did it pass for her like in an instant or was yeah. she conscious of that 40 years? Yeah, good question. So, so body kind of stayed. in the case, she will have thought that the teleportation occurred immediately, but it turns out to have been 40 years. Does that change your thinking about it? Well, that might challenge the way we think about time because we find the problem with identity consistency is the persistence through time. Mm -hmm. But time is, how do you say, like, we made it up. Right. It's, it's relative. How time works. Time is relative. Right. So maybe time isn't the relevant factor. In persistence. In persistence. Good. Okay. So this is a cool thought. Time not being the relative factor in persistence. Um, so this is not a view that we'll talk about outside of you know the soapbox I'm about to step up on, but it's called uh, 4E. Uh, so, so the idea of um, this is that you have, what's the actual weird funky name for this? Um, I can't remember, but the idea is that we're all space time worms, that identity is not like to, to be measured between time one and time two or time three and time four. Uh, and that in fact, there's no identity. So like, I don't exist right now and I won't exist in five minutes. But if we look at the whole picture of my life, uh, four dimensionalism, I think what this is called. If I look at the whole picture of my life, that's where identity resides. So at any particular moment, yourself is incomplete. It's uh, mm. insubstantial to what we really mean when we talk about ourselves. So if you think about, it's like a painting, right? Every life might be um, a brush stroke in every moment of every life is just a brush stroke on the four dimensional painting of your identity. And it's not until that, that, that uh, painting is complete, right? That you've lived your whole life that you can say that the self exists. And this is to say that persistence is not a matter of like temporal connection, right? Like one moment to the next, what is that which persists? But rather you take time and you make it two dimensional and you can see the whole life smeared out over it, right? Um, and now time is not a feature of, um, of identity so much as 
uh, all of the properties held together by you know, um, all of the time that the that, that you know that like being life form or whatever existed the whole painting cool um, that's a view that's out there what's that called four dimensionalism um, so then there's another like four syllable word name for it that I can't remember right now so then that means we will never be ourselves because the well, so, moment we die would be the completion of who we are if we're taking our whole life into aspect of yeah okay so so be careful how you conceive the idea when you say that we'll never be ourselves that's not really what the view is it's it's saying that that question is uh uh misunderstood right so it's not that like there we think that we're a self and we're actually not like you, you still what we are whatever you are it's just when we talk about the the like robust sense of like identity what you really are metaphysically the, in in the important sort of sense mm, okay. that's the thing that only okay. exists in the like four-dimensional time worm mm. like any time slice or any two connections between time slices is not enough to count for what we mean when we want to have a robust sense of identity you might have a bunch of like weaker, not sound conceptions of identity, like I'm my memory, but then you forget things and you say, well, that's enough for me to like live my life. Right. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about in the grand scheme of things, like the real science of identity, this view would say that that doesn't exist in the day to day and only exists in the zoomed out, okay. like all through time. Okay. Right? And then where the boundaries are, upper grabs, who knows, right? You can argue it's like, um, you know, birth and death or um, you know, like maybe your legacy lives on and that counts somehow, you know, arguments abound. Um, an unfinished painting can still be considered art. Yeah, sure. I wish I had a pen to write on the board, I don't. So we'll do one more case before moving on to, to Hume. Um, so uh, imagine instead of brain swapping and teleporting, we have, uh, two people, um, and one by one, they trade atoms, right? So we have, say, like, who are Peggy and Alfred, okay? And we take one of Peggy's atoms, and we put it in Alfred, and we take one of Alfred's atoms, and we put it in Peggy. Are they both Peggy and Alfred? Is Alfred over here and Peggy over here, like they were before? Just one? Just one, just one single atom. Wow, we're really challenged by this. <laughs> I, mean, good. I mean, technically, no, because they're not exactly what they were in that yeah. frame of time and that specific, you know, again, frame of time. So technically they are different, but overall they are the same. Okay, so so again, let's distinguish between qualitative and numeric identity. So numeric identity is our X equals X relation, right? So we break numeric identity, like when Locke is talking about complex bodies, if you take away like one part of it or add something else and it becomes a different complex body. So let's let's set aside the, the idea of numeric identity and say like get, give it like a, a Keter's Paribus for all intents and purposes kind of consideration. Like when I'm saying like, am I still here? You know, that, that kind of thing. Are you still you, right? Um, in everyday parlance, so to speak. Say like we switch one atom of Peggy with one atom of Alfred. Maybe they like, you know, make out and then break apart. And that's how they've traded atoms. So it, 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 like kissing somebody doesn't delete you, <laughs> you know, right? Um, so, so in that sense, it's like Peggy's still here and Alfred's still here. Yeah. I'm, I'm really leaning on you guys to say yes. Okay. So yeah. let's say we trade two atoms. Yeah. That's pretty small. Like, okay. I mean, you think about it, there's been people who've actually like um, have taken like a limb from someone else. However, there's been cases where they get the, oh, what is it called? It's like a- Graft, skin graft. Well, they've actually taken like a full arm, but then their arm like doesn't feel part of them anymore. Oh yeah, so you get like ghost pains and- That's right, pains yeah, yeah, the ghost yeah. pains are like the weird like twitches that you're like, I didn't do that. Yeah, so so the, there's a whole philosophy of pain that deals with this problem, uh, where like amputees will still feel their limbs, uh, ghost yeah. limb 
um, issues. Th these are interesting problems. So um, you should see where I'm going. I'm going to ask you three and then four atoms, right? Okay. Um, how about at the 50% mark? They should be completely bizarre Cronenberg monstrosities, right? Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line, we would have said, you know, they're still Peggy and Alfred, but certainly not at the halfway point. Mm -hmm. And then let's say we keep trading back and forth and we go to like the 100% other side. Now, Peggy's over here and Alfred's over here, whatever the opposite was of the beginning that I started with, right? Now, for that, like all intents and purposes, who's who, we're going to say like Peggy's over here and Alfred's over here. Mm -hmm. But there was some strange period in the middle where they were neither themselves and they slowly transitioned back. What's the right way of deciding which atom it was that broke, turned them into monstrosities? Is there a way that we can say which it was? Say like, you know, as the brain atoms start going back and forth, they start remembering things that you know, weren't their memories. Alfred remembers some of Peggy's memories and Peggy some of Alfred's memories. But then they switch all the way back and now they're on opposite sides with all of their original atoms and their original memories. So, so mentally, um, physically with the brain and physically like with the like construction of our bodies, um, there's a vagueness. It's called the Sorites problem. This is a super famous philosophical um, uh, problem uh, from ancient Greece, uh, like Zeno's paradox and stuff, where the, the Sorites problem is like, what's a heap? So you like um, drop a grain of sand. He says, is that a heap? And the interlocutor says, no, it's just a grain of sand. You drop two. It's like, no, it's not a heap. At what point does it become a heap? This is the vagueness problem. Mm. There's no strict rule. There's no empirical scientific way of saying when the pile of sand becomes a heap. Similarly with identity, it seems that with memory and with uh, like brain chemistry, with like physical atoms, it, it's identity is vague, right? There's no line in the sand that we can say you've crossed it and you cease to be yourself. It just sort of is all gray area in between. It's really hard to say. Um, and sometimes we think that, um, that uh, you know, speaking identity, that just the mental stuff is enough. Um, but sometimes the, the, the mental stuff as realized in the brain doesn't even seem to be enough. And then we start asking about, you know, like Peggy teleporting and it, we get a little disturbed by, you know, her being shot, but maybe a little less so by her being vaporized. And we feel a little more attachment to the body, even though there she is on the other side of things, you know, alive and happy dancing with her alien friend. So this is all, these, all of these cases are, are supposed to um, hopefully have made you feel very confused about our commitments to identity, okay? Um, and if you feel that way, good. Uh, it, it should be either an inspiration to answer these problems, right? Come up with something like four-dimensional time worms and, you know, where the brush, every moment of our lives is a brushstroke on the painting of existence or whatever. Um, and if it's not that, then what's the alternative? Do we need to be committed to this idea of self? When I speak in the first person, does that I that I refer to really do the important empirical and uh, normative work that, uh, that I hope that it does in order to justify my attachment to it? And what we're gonna see in Hume and Parfit at the very end um, is that maybe we don't need to be attached to this sense of self. So Hume and the sense of self. If you didn't read Hume, it's awesome. I recommend it. Hume kicks ass. Um, so here's our outline. Okay, so Hume, like Locke, is an empiricist. He's Scottish, um, but we call him a British empiricist anyways. Um, and it's funny, I think he is lumped in with the British empiricist, but he is Scottish. It seems unfair to Hume. Um, He's a naturalist, so he's interested in doing science and collecting data and um, justifying his philosophical convictions with um, good mechanical scientific practice. He writes two books, famously. He writes several books, but these are the two really famous ones. A Treatise of Human Nature was his first, and Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding was his second. Everything that we are about to talk about um, was written in the first book. 
which he disavowed and said, don't read that book. I don't think any of that stuff anymore. And rewrote um, the, in the inquiry and the personal identity stuff does not exist in the inquiry, the, the second book. Um, and the, you have, the, the, in the history of philosophy, there are several um, examples of this happening. Um, and in some cases, like in Wittgenstein's, they like go black to white, basically, like they just completely flip the script and think the opposite of what they thought before. It's not really the case with Hume. Hume is still pretty consistent. Like, so the ideas in the treatise are consistent and of a similar mind, set of intuitions, whatever, as they are in the inquiry. Um, but in the secondary literature, you get some disagreement about like, should we only read the inquiry because he disavowed the treatise or whatever. The personal identity stuff is interesting, it's fun. So what we will treat with the treatise. Um, so in order to get a sense of like why Hume argues what he does about identity, we need to do a little bit of background work on Hume's taxonomy of mind, understanding what the human experience is all made of. And he says it's made of two things, thoughts and impressions. Um, so thoughts or ideas are things like memories, images, beliefs, concepts, and impressions or sensations, emotions, drives. Um, so I have like a sensation of heat or cold, blueness or redness. Uh, I have a sensation of like sharpness or dullness, etc. And then I have an idea of um, computer, human, um, telephone, cable, right? The concepts and ideas. I believe that it's not raining right now, et cetera. Um, sort of more complex uh, sets of impressions, which is really what they are. So um, impressions build together in the mind to create ideas. What though our thought seems to possess this unbridled, unbounded liberty, we shall find upon near examination that is really confined within very narrow limits. And that this creative power of the mind amounts to no more than the faculty of compounding, transposing, augmenting, or diminishing the materials afforded us by the senses and experience. So what he's talking about here is how the mind uses, I think this is the language for him, the power of imagination to conform impressions together to create complex ideas. Um, so when we think of a golden mountain, we join two consistent ideas, gold and mountain, with which we are formally acquainted. So I have a concept or an idea gold and one of mountain. I put them together. I have a golden mountain. So I have a slightly more complex idea. Uh, and this is how the mind works. We have a bunch of symbols through impressions um, that conform into more complex ideas. And then we can conform complex ideas, horse, horn, unicorn, et cetera, right? OK, so um, there are empiricist constraints on Hume's philosophy. Um, and his target question is, is there a self? Okay, so is there, when I say, when I speak in the first person, am I actually talking about anything substantial? Is there a thing out there? Um, so whether or not God exists, let's assume God doesn't, and, and I'm not assuming this, but just like hypothetically, uh, then when the religious person says, I believe in God, they're not actually talking about anything, right? Because in this hypothetical, God doesn't exist. Similarly here, Hume is going to say, is there a self? So when I say, I'm going to the store, um, is this like the case of believing in God when God doesn't exist? Is there really a self to, to which I'm, I'm referring? Um, and if, if there isn't, then the sentence just kind of doesn't refer to anything. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so is there a referent for this word I or for self? Meaning when I use the word I, is there something out in the world to which that utterance refers? Um, and if there is, then there's like a truth relation between my sentence and the thing in the world. Like if I say, uh, I'm sitting, but there's no such thing as an I, then my sentence is false, right? Because there's no I to be sitting. But if there is, then yeah, I'd be sitting. So what, if anything, is the subject of our psychological property or self attributions? Um, when I say like, I intend to go to the store, I'm afraid, I want pizza, I believe Jones won, et cetera. And this is distinct from Locke's question, we should notice, because what Locke is asking is what's the criteria for personal identity? He's not asking if there is a self. Um, it becomes implicit with his discussion that there is a self and that what's, what we're interested in through Locke is um, not whether, but what, right? So he asks, is it body? Is it continuity? Uh, is it uh, psychology or consciousness? No, it's memory is, is the what of identity. And these are different kinds of questions and Hume is gonna rule out the second kind of question as we go forward. So um, S, Hume's question is fundamental to Locke's question because in order for there to be criteria of self, there has to be a self in the first place, right? Um, in order for there to be uh, 
a pepperoni pizza, there have to be there has to be like cheese and bread and sauce first. Otherwise, you don't have a pizza at all. Okay. Strange metaphor, but there you go. Um, so Hume is going to give a negative answer to S. He's going to say, look, there's no self, and we'll call this thesis M. Okay. Um, but he might also be saying E, that there's no evidence of the self, that we can't know of a self. So M would be something metaphysical. That's why I named it M. Um, there is no self, which is to say, like, in the world, in the cosmos, there's no such thing that exists as a self. Whereas epistemologically, to do with our knowledge, right, we remember epistemology, um, if we have no evidence of the self or we cannot know a self, this means that there might be such a thing as the self out there, we just don't have access to it mentally. Whatever it is that allows us to know things does not allow us to know the self, right? And one of these claims is stronger than the other because there might in fact be um, a self, but we just can't know it. Um, or if you say that there is no self whatsoever, that's a pretty strong claim, saying there's no self and I can know that there's not a self. So both the strong eliminativist claim, the metaphysical one, and the weaker epistemic claim imply that uh, the search for a criterion of identity is misguided. So Locke is he's a step ahead of himself. Um, and since Hume at least denies that we're in a position to answer as at least the epistemic part, um, then C is a non-starter. So the criteria for personality, we shouldn't even worry about it, says Hume. We need to worry about something much earlier and more fundamental. So now that we have a sort of sense of Hume's taxonomy of mind and his project, let's talk about his ideas of identity. So identity, according to Hume as he defines it, is the invariableness and uninterruptedness of an object through a supposed variation in time. This sounds a lot like numeric identity through time, right? Same kind of thing that we were talking about with Locke um, before, though Locke is a little bit fast and loose with his idea of numeric identity through time. So Hume takes the idea of identity to be incompatible with change. So think of like the identity of complex objects again for Locke, that as soon as you change it, then it breaks the identity. We're gonna be really strict in Hume's case. Um, and this is largely due to his empiricism, right? There needs to be evidence if we're gonna make a claim. Um, so Hume's emphasis thus seems to be on qualitative identity rather than numeric identity, because what we're looking for in change is a qualitative difference. And if there's no qualitative difference, then you probably have numeric consistency. But if there is a qualitative difference, then you don't. Okay. Um, so if this is the definition that we want to satisfy uh, for a person or any object to persist across time, then no person persists the identical selves across time because we're always changing, right? Everything, like uh, what I'm thinking in one moment is not what I'm thinking in the next. And this is enough, this is change. And if there's any change, there's no invariable uninterruptedness of the object through time. Um, and so we get two different kinds of accounts. Uh, we'll call the epistemic justificatory account and the causal genetic account, big fancy philosophy words, just you know, two different kinds of views that could explain um, why we think there's a, a sense of identity anyways. So there's, there's always change that breaks our definition of identity, but why do we suppose that there is something that persists? It could be explained in either of these cases. So what evidence do we have? Um, Hume says, if any impression gives rise to the idea of self, that impression must continue invariably the same through the whole course of our lives, since self is supposed to exist after that manner. So like if I am looking at something and I have an impression of brownness, and then I have an idea of like a brown object, um, and I, what I want is to say that I have evidence of, of a self, of an identity, then I need to have a similar sort of experience. I need to have an impression of this I, and if I want the I to persist, then it can't change. So my impression must always be present, uninterrupted, must always be there. And what Hume's going to say is like, look, that just never happens. We feel things. And, um, you know, like sometimes we wake up on the wrong side of the bed, sometimes we wake up on the right side of the bed. And, and that impression of self, whatever it is, changes all the time. And so no impression is gonna really have the right content um, to uh, be evidence of self. But what about introspection? And this is like super fan, I love this quote. For my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble upon some particular perception or other of heat or cold, of light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never catch myself at any time without a perception and never observe anything but the perception. I love this. And I'm really sad that 
I forgot I made a meme about this. So I'll show it at the end of the class because I'm really proud of the meme. Um, but uh, what Hume is saying here is, look, when I look inwardly, when I introspect and think like, where am I? And I'm trying to, like I have an impression of like my hand when I look at it, right? Um, I'm trying to have that same impression of a self. Wherever I look, I have other impressions. I have an impression of sadness or of uh, uh, blackness or you know whatever the color of the inside of your eyelids is. Um, I have an impression of uh, how I feel in the current moment. So I, I have a, an impression of heat or an impression of uh, it being dark, but where's the eye? There's just all the sensations, right? Wherever I look, I don't see a self, I see a sensation. Where's the eye? Nowhere seems to be. There's only feelings. Um, so what Hume concludes is that we have no evidence of a substantial self. If we look inwards or if we look outwards, nothing, everything changes all the time and there's no impression of a self. There's only impressions of sensations in our experience. So we lack evidence from experience at being a good scientist, a good empiricist, then we lack good reason to be committed to that thesis, right? There's no evidence for it. So Hume's epistemic commitments as an empiricist constrain his metaphysics that I can't, I, I don't have, I just don't have evidence of this thing that, that I think is there. And so I think that I can't really claim that it is there at all. And Hume takes a similar stand with respect to knowledge of the external world. The external world is always changing. Um, induction. So if you're doing any kind of science or mathematics, you're using induction, um, like a, a scientific, like gravity, in fact. Like, so every time I drop this, it falls at a rate of 9.81 meters per second-ish. Um, and every time it's happened, every time it's been dropped like that, it falls in the same way. Um, Hume uses a similar form of argument to undo induction and say, just because it's happened every time doesn't mean it's going to happen the next time and that your justification is a leap away from deductive reason. Um, and likewise with causation, that uh, A will lead to B, that the billiard ball you hit will um, cause all the rest to move. Now, it always does, but we don't have evidence empirically to say uh, necessarily that it will. That takes a leap in reason. So two interpretations of Hume's account, okay? Red, remember that the metaphysical one, there is no self, and the other the epistemic, that we have no evidence for the self. These are different claims. And some interpreters read Hume as saying M and others as E. I read Hume as being agnostic on the issue because it seems to me like he doesn't have good empirical evidence in the negative case either. Now he's you know arguing against our commitments to a self, which would appear to be a kind of metaphysical, like there is no self, but he doesn't explicitly say that. He's saying like, look, we just can't say that there is. And he does have positive theses about what the self is. So he's not just like trying to tear down the old way of thinking. Um, he's building up his own wall as well. But we each do have an idea of self. I of myself, you of yourself, and so on. And moreover, we each identify objects as the same objects across time, that this remote is the same remote that I dropped a moment ago. Right? How could we all be so how can we all say this about ourselves in the world um, if Hume is right, if we don't have evidence, if we're all mistaken all the time? What explains this mistake? Well, Hume maintains that we are epistemically unjustified in our idea of self and our attribution of identity, but we each have these ideas and we can't help but to have them. It's just like a way that we must understand the world and ourselves. And so Hume gives these two kinds of accounts to explain what's going on in our head to make us be convinced of this story of there being a self. What is the underlying explanation of these um, mechanisms that cause us to think I exist or the uh, remote is the same one that I dropped a moment ago. So here's the mistake. If identity requires unchanged invariability, then there's nothing in experience, including introspection when we look inwards, um, that provides evidence for the self. Uh, our eyes cannot um, uh, turn in their sockets without varying our perceptions. We can't introspect, we can't think without creating change. Um, we do no less have an idea of the self. Uh, and so uh, Hume says, look, this is the bundle theory of self. 
When I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I stumble upon some particular perception uh, or other of heat or cold light. I never find myself, but I find all these other perceptions. And at the same time, I have a, a deep ingrained sense of identity of self-existing. So there's an attachment of this commitment to identity and the set of perceptions bundled together whenever I look for myself. And that is what causes me to mistake, um, to, to make the mistake of commitment, to uh, mistake the bundle of impressions that are related through the imagination and through like similar sensation to one another to some invariable uninterrupted thing. They're always changing, but they're similar enough that I can sort of forget that they are changing. So Hume concludes, we're nothing but a bundle or collection of different perceptions which succeed each other with an inconceivable rapidity and are in perpetual flux and movement. Um, and he gives a theater analogy, says like, look, the self is kind of like a play um, where no single actor is the play, no single um, line is the play, uh, no stage um, uh, object is the play. It's sort of all of it together. Um, so, so imagine this, say you go on a tour uh, for a university, right? Like you're coming to the University of Utah, you go on the tour when the person walks backwards all the way uphill, it's kind of amazing to watch. Um, and they say, uh, here is the humanities building, here's the library, here's the student union, here's the, you know, the dorms, whatever, they take it to every building and they point it out. And at the end of the, the uh, tour, you say, okay, great but where's the university, right? They, they showed you a bunch of buildings, but they didn't show you the university, right? So you've had a tour of a bunch of individual spots and the university is something over and above, something else. Um, it's what Gilbert Ryle in his book, Concept of Mind calls the ghost in the machine when talking about identity. Um, so, so like you can do the same thing with self and say like, well, here's the heart and here's the brain and here's your legs. And you say, okay, but where are you? And it's this one extra thing right, that just doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, so similarly, we think of ourselves as this theater, as passing of impressions across the stage. And we somehow holistically collect this information and bundle it together and assume there we are. But this does not suffice for identity because there is properly no simplicity in at one time nor identity in different times, whatever natural propension we may have to imagine that simplicity and identity. It just doesn't exist. Everything's always changing on stage. So the mind is nothing but a bundle or collection of different perceptions. So then the question is, what then gives us such a great propension to ascribe an identity to the succession of propensions or perceptions? Sorry. Um, and our answer is that well, it's not from a single perception because we have all sorts of different ones. Um, but we still we imagine ourselves. Um, that we are a diverse but related succession of events. And the way this works is by distinguishing identity from diversity. We are not picking out the identity of our being, but rather the diversity of our being and what sort of holds that diversity together um, through similarity. There's a resemblance in our diversity that is enough to cause us to make the mistake of thinking that that's enough for identity. Read that. So we talked about this tree case last week. Does anybody remember it? Like you plant the acorn and it becomes the sapling, it becomes the big old tree, right? None of these are the same thing. The acorn is like that big and the big tree makes hundreds of them. Right? It's nothing like the acorn. In fact, every part of the acorn that was there has germinated away and, and become something completely new in, in the tree. So you look out the window and every day you watch the tree grow for you know like 10 years or whatever and the acorn becomes the tree. Um, what makes us think that it's the same thing is just it was so every day I look outside and it's still there and it's, it changes a little bit, but it only changes a little bit and that's enough for me to be lost in the illusion of the identity of this persisting object, even though my impressions of it are different every day. There's a diversity of impressions, but not so unresembling a diversity as for me to think, well, it's not the same thing anymore. Um, so we mistake related identities for identical ones, and we do so by memory and imagination. Here's how it works. So here's a lady, let's call her Peggy again. Peggy's looking at, at a tomato, and she has the perceptual experience of looking at a tomato. Um, now, our, 
the most popular theory of perception says that in perceiving, you have a representation of the object in your mind. So you're not actually directly, it's called like naive realism. You're not directly perceiving the world as it is. What you're having is a representation in your mind that is inspired by uh, interaction of world with perceptual mechanisms. Um, and this is to be uncommitted to a world in itself and only committed to like what we experience in our conscious experience through perception. Um, this is why it's a popular view. So anyways, here's Peggy looking at a tomato and this causes a representation of the tomato. It has redness and roundness and say she blinks and opens her eyes again, peekaboo tomato, right? Um, now she is looking at what she thinks is the same tomato, but she's peekabooed it. It's a few seconds later. Um, it's an object that resembles what she was just looking at. Maybe like I switched out a very similar tomato and she still thinks she's looking at the same one, right? Because this resemblance is strong enough. And as she goes back, she thinks, well, you know, I was looking at something really similar a second ago and two seconds ago and three seconds ago. And this is enough for her to say, I've been looking at the same tomato. So we have a resemblance of cause and effect of this perceptual experience that allows us to mistake what is diversity, what is full of change for identity. Same thing with the self, right? That I'm a bundle of perceptions, but I'm consistent enough that in any moment, I resemble what I did in the moment before. And this relation is what causes me to make the mistake through imagination. So given the perceived and imagined resemblances of causes and effects, the tomato continues to exist. It causes me to see it. Um, and so I assume it's the same thing throughout time, creates a fiction of a continued tomato or in the case of identity, continued self. So our experience reveals resemblance and causal relations between perceptions and the transition between perceptions is coherent and smooth. By our very nature, we imagine that there must be some unifying thing, a continued self, we can't help but to think it. And so we're epistemically unjustified in having this conviction but here we are anyways, we can't help it. And this is why we think it. So Hume has shown us why we are unjustified, like why we shouldn't think that there is a substantial self, but has also given a cool explanation of like what is going on behind the scenes to make us think that. So we'll end the lecture with Parfit. What Parfit says in his book at the very end, he, he screams like, stop worrying about identity. This thing, just it's too complicated. And in fact, it doesn't really matter anyways. And by worrying so much about what is the eye, is it my memory, is it my physical body, is it my brain, is it um, my experiential interaction with the world phenomenologically represented, um, none of this is what matters. Because none of that does the work that we care about when we care about ourselves and how we do what we do in the world. What matters, says Parfit, is survival. And survival does not need to be numeric identity or even qualitative identity. It can be really spread out and look really different in, in a lot of different ways. So what matters to us is not some abstract criterion for self or the ephemeral, unexplainable soul that lives within us. Any thought experiment can change your intuition. We can at one point think that, well, we start switching atoms and this breaks us, but you know, still like roughly the same mentally. Right? Um, or you can think that, uh, you know, you're the same mental and physical thing, but teleported 40 years later and your relationship to the world is totally changed and this breaks you, right? That we can change the, the case and give a different criteria of self. Um, but again, none of this really matters. Um, and when we apply strong deductive reasoning, we see that it's all a fiction anyways, but we still care about the question, right? Still, like I'm still speaking in the first person. I can't help it. Right? It matters to me that I am a thing in the world because I live and act and I care, I love, I, I have like emotions and feelings, we all do, right? We're all beings in the world that matter in our own story that wanna make our mattering important for other people and to make that set of relations healthy and valuable. We all wanna do as well as we can, right? And if we don't exist, then what is it that is the operative force that moves us through the world in order to make that world a better place, our world a better place, the world for the, the people that we love a better place, right? Um, this is what matters. And this is why survival for Parfit is more important than a continuity criterion or a physical continuity criterion, whatever, right? This is all just metaphysical babble that distracts us 
from why we care about being in the world. So Parfit says, is the truth depressing? There is no self. It, or should we feel bad about this? Some may find it so, but I find it liberating and consoling. That when I believed that my existence was a further fact, that there was some other thing about me that I, I could eventually point to and find myself. I seemed imprisoned in myself. My life seemed like a glass tunnel through which I was moving faster every year, and at the end of which there was darkness. When I changed my view, the walls of my glass tunnel disappeared. I now live in the open air. There's still a difference between my life and the lives of other people, but the difference is less. I'm less concerned about the rest of my own life and more concerned about the lives of others. And I love this quote, right? So what's happening in this, this is like an interlude in an otherwise like really dense, rigid um, work of philosophy. Uh, he, he sort of like steps out of the arguing it, almost like unbidden, and then says this, and it's this incredibly human moment. Um, and, and I think this is totally missing in analytic philosophy, it's just like contemporary philosophy generally today is um, finding the appropriate place for human moments. And, and this is one of them. And, and what Parfit is telling us here is, is look that when we think that identity is my mind or my body or my relation to the world or that there's some thing around and in this, some further fact about my constitution that makes me and I, um, I felt constrained because that thing is moving through space and will not always be here, death comes. But as soon as I recognized that any further fact I tried to find of myself, I couldn't find and I gave up looking for it. It's like the walls disappeared and I just floated out, right? Because what's left is your survival. And this does not require any further fact about what's going on here. It can be realized through your legacy, through your influence, through your loved ones, through the world as you change it, right? Your survival, if you're a clone or if you're a strange Cronenberg amalgamed mess of Peggy and Alfred, probably not, but um, whatever is enough to cause you to go forward and what you care about, as long as what you care about is still taken care of and, and made, made to have meaning and matter in the world, then who cares you know, if like your soul disappears or your body is vaporized or your brain is split in half? Um, all the better maybe because you have you know, like two people taking care of your loved ones instead of one. Right. So what's the new view? Well, when we body swap or are teleported through space, when we trade brains with a parrot or reconstituted uh, atom by atom with another person, the self remains a jumbled mess. The self is we're committed to in sort of uh, intuitive everyday parlance. But what lives throughout these different forms of being is care, what we give a damn about. I give a damn about the person who ends up on Mars, even if, you know, like the one on Earth gets shot, because that's the person that you know, is at the end of the day hungry and just like me and, um, you know, like take care of my cat and call my friends and, you know, all this, right? We have the same hopes and desires and fears, and it doesn't matter how those live on just so long as they do. And so survival of the self for Parfit just means survival of what's important to the self. Nothing metaphysically strange, but what's real and what we create out in the world with one another and with our interactions with it. Um, Seven. Yeah, so I'll call it here. Don't leave just yet. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, so see you next week if you're watching on YouTube.